Welcome to this walk through Philippians 4, verses 4 to 7. In chapter 4, we hear Paul applying the mindset of Christ that he celebrated in the hymn back in chapter 2. Paul prepared for this application in chapter 3 by warning about two false approaches to the gospel in contrast to a life centered on God in Christ and striving for the upward call of God in Christ. So our first section in chapter 4, we saw Paul applying this vision of unity with Christ and in Christ to the broken relationship between Yodia and Syntyche. And now we see further applications to the community as a whole. So this section is addressing the community as a whole, though it applies to the individual level also. And these qualities enable the unity Paul has been promoting. Their unity in all their life is in curio, in the Lord. So this section is an expression of a life centered in Christ and striving for the upward call as described in chapter 3, all of which is grounded in sharing in the mindset of Christ back in chapter 2. Our verses today begin with several short sentences. So the first one here in verse 4, Kairata in curio pantata, palin ero, kairata. So rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, Rejoice. Kairate could be indicative or imperative, and here the context indicates imperative. Um, a present imperative with this idea of something that's an ongoing uh, activity, uh, and the Pontete clarifies that. Ero is the future of Lego. So the motif of joy that we've seen a number of times in this letter is here emphasized. Verse 5. Ta epiakes humon. Genesteto pasen anthropois. Epiakes is an interesting word. It's translated in a lot of different ways. Gentle, yielding, tolerant, courteous, kind, uh, graciousness, forbearance. Uh, CGL, the concise lexicon by Danker, uh, says it means to practice restraint. So perhaps restraint or forbearance work well. Humon would be a subjective genitive. They're the ones doing uh, this restraint. Genesteto, third person imperative, eris passive. Every translation I looked at, about a dozen of them, uh, translate this let. Um, let your forbearance or whatever, your graciousness, be known to all men, to all people. Many recent Grammars emphasize that uh, the translation let for a third person imperative is very common in English, but can give the wrong impression that this is some kind of permission. So if we were to go with a more imperatival kind of translation, it might be something like your forbearance is to be known or your forbearance must be known uh, to all people. The aorist imperative is often used for specific command, a specific occasion, uh, but that wouldn't apply here. Both the present and the aorist can either refer to a general command or principle or a specific command for a particular situation, although more frequently the present will be used for general commands and the aorist for a particular situation. But here um, it's not just one particular time of letting your forbearance be known. Moving on, a curios in goose. The Lord is near, a uh, predicate position, so we supply, supply the verb um, a me. And um, the Lord is near could be he's about ready to appear uh, temporally, or the Lord is near in the sense that uh, he is present. So it's either temporal or spatial. The commentaries take different views on this. Uh, Gordon Fee thinks that it's both. He says this is as close to intentional double entendre as one finds in the Apostle. It's page 407. And uh, Hellerman in his uh, Egg and Tea volume uh, picks up on that as well. So it could refer to both. I personally think it's more the idea that the Lord is actually present now. And that truth enables the rejoicing that we've just heard about and also the practicing restraint. And also what we're going to hear about next of not worrying about anything, not being anxious for anything. So the Lord is near. Now, Augustine in his On Christian Doctrine, uh, 112, 
as a citation, has an interesting section on this whole concept of the Lord coming. Uh, here's what he says. And though he, the Lord, is everywhere present to the inner eye, when it is sound and clear, he condescended to make himself manifest to the outward eye of those whose inward sight is weak and dim. Not then in the sense of traversing space, but because he appeared to mortal men in the form of mortal flesh, he is said to have come to us. For he came to a place where he had always been, seeing that he was in the world, and the world was made by him. That's the translation in the Nicene and Post-Nicene Fathers, Series 1, Volume 2, page 525. So it's a helpful way of combining the biblical vision that the Lord is constantly present everywhere, and yet that the language that is uh, so often used in Scripture of the coming of the Lord. So Paul goes on to say, Meiden meremnate, meremnate, uh, present imperative. So be anxious, you all, second plural, for nothing, uh, accusative of reference or respect. Uh, be anxious with reference to or with respect to nothing. So don't worry about anything. Al in panti te pros yuche, kaite te ese, meta yucharistias, ta itemata humon genorizesto pros ton te on. So we've got a little bit more complex sentence here. So let's take a look at it in the map. So here we see the main thought is uh, be anxious for nothing, but let your request be made known. Your requests are to be made known, something like that. And this, to be made known, gnorizo, making known, uh, as opposed to just knowing, uh, gnosko, uh, is qualified by quite a few um, prepositional phrases and other things. So let's look at them. Uh, first one, uh, in everything. So in all circumstances, presumably, in everything, te prosuche, uh, I'm taking this as a dative of means, uh, with prayer and with petition or asking. Prayer in general and specifically your request, your petitions. With Eucharistias, uh, with, with thanksgiving, and to God. The word itemata is interesting. When you have a ma word in general, it's going to be the product of whatever the verbal idea is. So iteo means to ask, and so an itema is a asking, a petition, a request. And so we have these requests that we want to make known to God, um, but we do so with thanksgiving, and we do so in the context of joy. The interesting mindset here of not worrying about anything, but turning it all over to God in the context of joy. And then Paul brings in peace, in verse 7. Kahe rene tu theu, he huper echusa panta nun, frurese tas cardias humon kaita naemata humon in Christo Jesu. So this kai could be uh, with the sense of a result, the result of all this, the peace of God. Uh, check out BDAG 1B Zeta for that use of Chi. And the peace of God, this genitive, could be taken several different ways. could be a subjective genitive, the peace that uh, God um, exercises, uh, or source, uh, peace sourced in God, or perhaps possession, uh, God's own peace, uh, which would be similar to the subjective genitive in some ways. So the peace of God, which surpasses all noon. Uh, noose often means the mind. It can also mean the understanding. Here, BDAG suggests all power of thought. Huperecho, uh, a uh, participle here with the article, used adjectivally to describe irene. So the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding or all Power of thought, as BDAG says, all possible thought. Uh, Frurese, future, from frureo to guard. Uh, uh, fruros is a guard, and so this is to set a guard, as it were. 
the peace of God will set a guard or will guard uh, your hearts and your naemata. So naeo means to think. And so here's another ma word. The product of thinking is a thought. And so that's what this word generally means. Your hearts and now your thoughts in Christ Jesus. So how are we to take cardia here? Um, cardia is used in many ways in scripture. Uh, there's over 800, I can't remember the exact number of references to heart in the scriptures. I once started reading through all of them and hadn't gotten out of the Pentateuch before it became clear that cardia can refer to the very inner core of one's being from which everything else flows and to which everything else is related, sort of the integrating center. But also it could refer to thinking or to feeling or to a number of things. So what does it refer to here? Well, the two main options, um, because it's in the plural and because it's in the context of uh, naemata, some people take this as referring to feelings. So he'll guard your feelings and your thoughts uh, in Christ Jesus. Uh, the other way of looking at it is that cardia does have the sense of the inner core. He'll guard the very core of your being and the thoughts, your thoughts which arise. The naemata is added uh, because of their role in the kind of things that Paul's talking about, the mindset that we are to have in Christ and how they figure in uh, the not worrying because that's a response to thoughts, uh, the joy, the peace, uh, the place that the thoughts play uh, in the inner life. It's a big theme in Paul, very important. So I'm inclined to see the cardia here as the inner core and the thoughts then added to that. And the key point either way is that this is in Christ Jesus. That's what that's the reality that enables any of this to um, happen for the believer. In our next section, Paul is going to go on and develop um, how we use our minds and um, how the peace of God guards our hearts. So we'll look at that further in the next section.